Let's take a moment and uh, you pray for me that I'll teach you the truth and the right truth. And I will pray that whatever God has for you, you will hear it from him and not me. And so let's do that for each other, okay? Father, we come, uh, we want to be transformed from the inside out. We long to be more like Jesus. And we pray as we uh, study this passage that you would take words and turn, that in, turn them into nourishment that feeds our soul and our hearts and our minds. We pray these things in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. If you have your Bibles, turn to Luke chapter 2. It's a great passage. It, it, um, this passage, in my opinion, could be taught on any weekend, not just Christmas weekend. Uh, it is reflective of the nature of who God is and what he values and what he's doing, it's all here in this, in this beautiful story. So at least we run from Christmas day of yesterday and forget the deep truths. Let's look at verse 1 through verse 20 of chapter 2 of Luke. Luke's account of it. In those days... A decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria, and all went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth, and she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger, because there was no place for him in the inn. And in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find the baby wrapped in swaddling cloths, laying in a manger. And suddenly there was an, with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those whom he is pleased. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the sayings that had been told them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them, but Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds 
returned glorifying and praising God for all that they had heard and seen. It is as it had been told them. There's, there's many ways uh, to study this passage. Last week, we looked at it through the lens of this, that God is far more engaged in your story than you know or, or you see. Uh, the beauty of this story is how engaged God is in our story. And for the most part, it's somewhat invisible. But he is engaged in your story more than you see or you know. This morning, I want to look at the same passage through another lens. And so here's this one theme I want you to take away from this Christmas story. That God is a God of humility. This this story in every facet is a story of the deep, deep, deep value God has and the very nature of who God is in the simplicity of one word, humility. And to many, I, and I would be in this group, that this story is a story about humility and how valuable it is to God. Now, in our culture, whether you know it or not, we don't value Humility. We don't put a lot of stock in humility. We tend to rate ourselves by a social status. We evaluate ourselves based on what kind of job we do or where we live or what we drive, whether we fly in first class or coach. Um, we, we, we do that. And, and there is a longing in this culture in my life, to get to the top of the caterpillar pillar. Hope for the flowers, a great story of how the caterpillars all long to get to the top of the caterpillar pillar and they'll do all they can to get to the top of the caterpillar pillar and they'll climb over each other as much as they need to to get to the top of the caterpillar. But on the top of the caterpillar pillar, there's nothing there but a top of a caterpillar pillar. And so Jesus comes into our story and says, it's not about getting to the top of the caterpillar pillar. In fact, the secret of life is not getting to the top. The secret of life is getting to the bottom. It's a direct reversal of the very culture. But we all want to be powerful. We all want to have status. We all want to be VIP. We all want to sit in the first class. At least I do. I've sat in those chairs when I've been comped, not bought, comped them. And they're much bigger and they're much more comfortable. And they're much sweeter to you up there in first class than they are to you in coach. That's why they put a curtain up there so you don't know that. (laughs) And there is two worlds in life. Karen and I took our kids to Disney World years ago during that time when after the Super Bowl game, one of the two quarterbacks said, they said to him, They would ask the question, what are you going to do now that the Super Bowl is over? And they would always say, I'm going to Disneyland. That's what I'm going to do. And we happen to be at Disneyland, in this particular case, Disney World, on the same day that Brett Farr and Elway was there having gone and their families were with them and they were being escorted around Disney World. They they had their kids. I had my kids. I was nothing in the Disney World status. So my kids stood in those long lines for an hour and a half with their dad. And I, being the inquisitive one, I kept watching them and I always noticed they went into a secret door, a VIP door, and went to the front of the line and their kids waited three minutes when my kids waited 90 minutes. There is a sense that there is something at the top of the caterpillar pillar. And status means a lot. And, and, and many of us go through our whole lives feel inferior because of the, because of the, the status, the image the hype, the Facebook, the social status, the movie star. We, 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 we kind of go through life in a way we ought not to go through life. In the book, Descending into Greatness, the author says this, and the vocabulary of the world down is a word reserved for losers, cowards, and the bear market. It is a word to be avoided or ignored, especially in a polite society. It is a world that colors whatever it touches, down and out, downfall, downscale, downhill, downhearted, and worst of all, down under. A word, it seems, only on the unfortunate lips of the weak, 
the poor or the dead. If that wasn't enough, there is a crowning blow against the word. It's an an anonym, synonym, anonym, right? Did I get that right, Bruce? Doesn't sound right. Antonym. Antonym. That's what I said, didn't it? <laughs> oh, <laughs> that's why I need you, buddy. And that word is up, up. In our high voltage society is a word that has come to be cherished, almost a worshiped. It is a word reserved for winners, heroes, and those who know what life is about. It is a word to be admired and pursued, the way to influ influence whoever is present, upscale, up and coming, upwardly mobile, upper class, the word of the, of the few chosen and strong. Thus, the pull upward is incessant and powerful. It is a pull that uses pride and selfishness for its brick and mortar. And the influence of this upward pull is felt just as much in the church as outside of it. But those who choose to resist the pull, those who choose to follow Jesus by descending into greatness are always the ones who taste the greater portion of God's favor and joy. He goes on to say, I never cease to marvel of how God's ways are so different from the ways of the world. Consider, for example, the, the contrarian logic found in Scripture, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven, Matthew 5, 3. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth, Matthew 5, 5. I tell you a truth, Jesus says, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven, Matthew 18, 3. Jesus says in Matthew 20, 16, so the last shall be first and the first should be last. And yet in light of all of that, we still living in a culture that screams at us, that drips with power at the top resist somehow, uh, find ourselves somewhat hesitant to embrace the very humility that God by his very nature treasures. So what I want you to walk away with this morning, if you forget anything or everything, and remember one thing is the word humility. The Christmas story affirms the value in the kingdom of God for humility. And in the end, you never have to apologize to anyone for what you drove here in, how you're dressed, where you live, what you do. It has no bearing on the kingdom of God. And it has no bearing on your true identity in Christ. That's the power. So let's, let's just look at some humble truths in this passage in a somewhat devotional way. Verse 4. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem. Joseph, we, we, we explored this last week. Let me highlight again this week, was a blue collar worker. He was a carpenter. He was not a king. He was not a priest. He was not a rabbi. He was a carpenter, and as a carpenter, a very poor carpenter. We see that through the offerings that he made for sacrifices for his sins. God chose a carpenter to be the father of his child. I want... I, 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 we, we run past that truth. Of all the people God could have chose to be the father of his son, he chose a factory worker. He, he chose a man who worked at the mill, as it were. That's, that's who God chose. That, that's the humility of the story. That's the, the, the power of it. All we know of Joseph is found in Matthew 1, where he said, having been told that he was to marry and protect Mary, he says, Scripture says, he did as the Lord directed him. Joseph was an obedient man. And the kingdom of God and the humility of the kingdom of God is to obey God at whatever the consequences are. In that sense in Joseph, 
to obey was what attracted him. Let's go on. Verse 7. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no place for him in the inn. Not only does this story start with a humble father, but it goes to a humble inn. Because I want you to notice that, that God didn't direct them to a castle. There was no castle here. There wasn't even a mansion here. There wasn't a palace here. It was an inn, an ordinary inn. And I think the power of this story is that God continues to look for inns or inns of our heart or our heart inns, our humble beings where he can place his son into the story. God still wants to bring Jesus into your life, into your ordinary life, that there is nothing more special about anybody else than you where God will place you whereby Jesus takes residence within your heart. So please do me the favor. Please do yourself the favor of never minimizing your story and what God is doing in your story and what God wants to do through your life. Never minimize who you are to the exclusion that you can invite Jesus in into your life, into your choices, into your work, into your home. Never. Re remember the inn, a little inn. Remember it doesn't say castle and palace and mansion. It says an inn. Third truth about this humbling story is also found in verse 7. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in the manger. I mean, all of that is about humility. I mean, the, the story drips with it. I mentioned Friday night that in Greek literature and mythology and in Roman literature and mythology, when gods entered the, in, into the world of people, they entered for a day, they entered for a moment, and they entered for some self-gratification. They only came for a few hours, and then they were gone. That, that's how the Greeks and the Romans in mythology always saw that God would never want to linger here more than a day or for a moment or for an experience. He came and he left. And the story of Jesus being born a son is a story of humility because one, when God enters our world, he enters it for a lifetime. It's the only God that you will study or hear about that came for a lifetime. That is what is distinct about the Christian life. Jesus didn't come in the form of a human. He came as a human. And having come as a human, he comes into our stories and having lived a life knows exactly what you're going through. So if there's some part of your life that continues to straight arm a Jesus who knows your prayers, your depression, your discouragement, your loss, your tiredness, your sweat. If, if there's still a part of you that doesn't really believe that, that God in Jesus understands your world, then all you have to go to this Christmas story and discover that Jesus came for a lifetime. For 33 years, he experienced what you experienced. And for the most part, all of your experiences he experienced. And so he identifies with you. He enters your story. It's Emmanuel, God with us, or better yet, God with you. That's the power of this. But why a baby? Why a human being? Philip Yancey, in his book, um, The Jesus I Never Believed, talks about being someone who had this aquarium. And in this aquarium was this exotic group of fish. It was a saltwater aqua aquarium with the most beautiful fish. 
and every day when he would go and feed his fish, they would all scurry to the back of the aquarium, afraid of the very one who fed him. And in that experience of going every day, day after day after day, feeding these exquisite fish, thinking that somehow they would begin to befriend them, but every time he came to that glass, they scurried away, he began to discover maybe that is what the incarnation is about. God becomes man so that he can enter our stories and, and not cause us to scurry to the back of the aquarium. He becomes a baby so we don't run from his glorious holiness, righteousness, power. He becomes a baby that invites us into a deep intimacy with him. It is fundamental to the Christian life, this incarnation. John 1 and 2 and 14 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. Verse 14, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory. Glory is the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Philippians 2, 5 says, Have this mind among yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking on the form of a servant, being made in the likeness of men and being found in human form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. That's, that's the Philippians 2 explanation of Luke 2 that the God who created the universe, that God humbled himself. And having humbled himself, he became a human, and having become a human, he became a servant. And having become a servant, ser servant he died on a cross as a criminal. That is what the kingdom of God is all about. That is who God is. God is one who is holy, deeply holy. Bill Hybel says this, once Jesus' life on earth began, Jesus never stopped descending. Omnipotent, he cried. The owner of all things, he, be, he had no home. The king of kings became a bondservant. The source of truth, he was judged guilty of blasphemy. The creator, he was spit on by the creatures. The giver of life, he was crucified naked on a, on a cross, bled cross, gasping for air. With his de death, he descend, his descent was complete from the pinnacle of praise in the universe to the ultimate disbasement and torture of death on the cross, the innocent victim of human weakness. That's a, that is a really big truth. That's... The, 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 the Christmas story is about a God who values humility, who embraces it. Now, Mike sent me an email this week, it, which is a good email. It was entitled, No E and Cloth. So look at verse 7 when it comes to this humili humility. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths. I always say clothes on that. She wrapped the king, the God of the universe, not in baby clothes, not in pajamas, not in soft wool, but cloth meaning strips, different strips, different thicknesses, different textures. And she took Jesus and wrapped him one by one and wrapped him from head to toe to keep him warm. It was, it was scraps of cloth somewhere found in the stable. Nothing elegant. When, when Billy was born, he was born six weeks early. It was 2 o'clock in, in, in the morning. Three hours later, I went to that very expensive supermarket, uh, shopping store called Target. <laughs> and there, 
spent as much money as I had on me to get him the softest, warmest, cuddly, but Gemma's clothes I could possibly find. I stacked the uh, basket with everything because I wanted my son to be warm and I wanted him to be special and I wanted everything to be great. And, and that basket was filled with the warmth and beauty of brand new things from Target. But not God's son. He was wrapped in cloths. Do you, sense, do you sense the humility in that story? The depth of what this story of Jesus is all about? But let's move on. Least, least the fact that Joseph was a blue-collar carpenter, and least the fact that the inn wasn't a mansion, and least the fact that the child was born and wrapped in cloths, and that still doesn't impress you on the humility of the Christmas story. Then go to verse 8. And in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field keeping watch over their flock by night. Shepherds. You, you know this, but let me drive it in. Shepherds were not in high esteem in Israel. They, they were, in, the, in truth, the bottom of the rung. They were, they were equal to tax collectors and guys that swept the streets after donkeys and horses Drop their droppings. That, that, that's the level. The, these guys, a shepherd, there was no esteem in being a shepherd. These were irreligious people. They were not respected by the rabbis and the priests because they didn't go to the temple every Saturday. They didn't take the Sabbath. They were still working. The, these people were, were th there was no sense of purity about them. They were smelly. They were dirty. They, they lived in the field. These guys were not priests. They were not kings. They were not rabbis. They were ordinary guys in a field on the bottom of the religious ladder. And God, now catch this, and God chose them to be the first to hear. So the next time you think you're not important enough, your status is not high enough, you're, you're in the back of coach and not in first class, whatever that is that makes you feel inferior, know that God values those that are ordinary people and not necessarily religious people. My guess is the rabbis and the priests struggled on this story, if for no other reason than of all the people that God should appear to it through an angel, it wouldn't be shepherds. The most magnificent announcement of a birth ever made went to shepherds. So here's, here's a big truth. James 4, 6 says this, but he gives greater grace. Therefore, it says, God is opposed to the proud, but great, gives grace to the humble. That's, that's the Christmas message. Romans 2, 11, God is not a respecter of persons. God doesn't hold people in a status. We're all equal. We're all level at the foot of the cross. There's no one that has a higher uh, degree of value in the kingdom of God than any other person. We are all brothers and sisters, equal in stature. And the moment that you feel that people are looking down at you, I, I say this, and the moment you find yourself looking up at people, I say this, and if you do look down at people, I say this, that the kingdom is, is announced, this incredible message is told to ordinary shepherds. Again, blue-collar workers, if you must, working the night shift. Verse 10. And the angel said to them, fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. Here's the amazing part of this story. The, the, the gospel, the good news, doesn't come to Jews. 
It comes to Gentiles and Jews, or Jews and Gentiles. It doesn't come to those that are religious. It doesn't come to people who went to church their whole life. It doesn't come to people who only have devotions. It doesn't come to people who, and the list goes on, it comes, the good news is for all people. That, that's, that's the beauty of it. Now, now here is something um, to get your head around. The word angel means a messenger. Angels are messengers. There's much we could teach on it. I've scratched through all my notes that are unrelated to this core truth here of good news. Luke 15.10 says this. In the same way I tell you, Jesus is speaking, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. When one person repents of their sinfulness and puts their faith in the one who was born and laid in a manger, the angels rejoice over that. That's what that, that's what Jesus wants you to hear, that the angels celebrated the moment you put your faith in Jesus Christ. At that moment, there was an applause in heaven over the fact that you put your faith in. That's how interested angels are in your story. That's why they are to minister to you and around you. 1 Peter 1.12 says this, and it was revealed to them, this is the prophets, that they were not serving themselves, but you. When they spoke of these things that have now been told you by those who preach the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, even the angels long to look into these things. Peter says there's something crazy in the angels think that God would become a baby and born to die for you and me. And the angels, as it, 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 the imagery is they stoop. They're in heaven stooping down going, why in the world is he dying for them? Why does he love them so much? What is this, uh, this good news of grace all about? And they can't. Figure it out because they know how holy and majestic God is. That, that's, that's the deep truth. Verse 11, a Savior who is Christ the Lord. A Savior who is Christ the Lord. So here's the truth. We all need saving. For all of sin and come short of the glory of God. You've heard it a hundred times. But I think salvation has more to do with it than just that. We need salvation from the consequences of our choices. We need salvation from our sin. We need salvation from our mistakes. We need salvation from our disobedience. We need salvation from our brokenness. We need salvation from our shame. We need salvation from our guilt. We need salvation from our arrogance. We need salvation from our superiority. We need salvation from our greed. We need salvation from our bitterness. We need salvation from our anger. We need salvation from our lostness. We need salvation from our confusion. We need salvation from our hopelessness. The gap. The chasm between you and God is so great that no amount of works will get you there. No amount of religion will get you there. No amount of church will get you there. Only Jesus can get you there. That's this message of good news. John, uh, John 14, 6, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Acts 4, 12 says, there is one name given under heaven whereby you must be saved. 1 Timothy 2, 5 says there is one mediator between God and man, the man Jesus Christ. If there was no Christmas story, we would all be lost and there wouldn't be anything we could do about it. Verse 19, 
last element of this sense of humility, the humility of a father, a humility of an inn, a humility of a baby, a humility of a shepherd, the humility of the gospel message of humbling ourselves, the humility of, G of Mary. Look at verse 19. But Mary treasured up these things, pondering them in her hearts, and the shepherds returned, glorifying, praising God for all that they had heard and seen as it had been told to them. Two truths here that I want to give you. And, and, and they're very deep and almost counterintuitive. Truth number one is that There's something in our culture that's fast-paced, noisy, loud, that causes you and I not to ponder and treasure the scriptures. I think there's an epidemic in the Christian community, in the American Christian community, in the Western Hemisphere, whereby we hear scripture, but we don't ponder scripture. We don't treasure scripture. We don't take it in. And, I, and I'm really struggling as a communicator at learning and figuring out, and forgive me, I'm, I'm in the process of how many times should I stop in my teaching and just give you time to ponder a deep truth and just give you five minutes. And, and for me to be uncomfortable with the five minutes, thinking you think I don't know where I'm going, but I'm really going to a place to allow you to ponder and treasure. Because the other people in the, in the stable, they, they were amazed by the truth, but, but Luke tells us, but, Mary pondered and treasured it. So here, here's the truth that I'm, I'm trying to experience in my own life and take me deeper and deeper into my own personal walk, is to begin to every day find a passage of Scripture and ponder it, to, to, to let it resonate within me, to memorize it, to, to meditate on it, to, to be reflective of it, to be contemplative of it. Because I believe, and I've said this before, the problem with the American church and why nobody's being transformed is right there. The American church doesn't value pondering and meditation and contemplation. We're all too busy talking to treasure something. I, I think somewhere in the story, Mary went to some part of that stable and alone held it deeply. But here's another deep truth, and it's going to sound like I'm being self-serving, but please don't hear me say that. You could miss this. I've missed it. The message Mary treasures and ponders did not come from an angel. It came from blue collar shepherds. Do you understand the depth of that truth? God, angel, shepherds, Mary, shepherds tell Mary she ponders them and treasures those words. What's the deep truth there? The deep truth is, that somehow God uses ordinary blue-collar shepherds, i.e. Bill Muir, to communicate truth to, to you. And somewhere along the line, when truth is taught, it doesn't always come through angels. It comes through ordinary people that are broken. And somehow you have to take that ordinary truth, that, that, that truth, and somehow begin to to figure out on your way home in this afternoon sometime to wonder what part of what Bill said was from God, and, and what part of from God's message do I need to ponder? Ephesians 4 talks about apostles and evangelists and pastors, teachers as, as the means of communicating God's word. Most of us, oh, let me tell you this, me, I've never got a message from the angel. It's always been through a teacher or a pastor. It was always at, in, in a Bible class. And so like you, I have to sit there and say, is this God? Because I guarantee you, if you woke up this morning and when you woke up, God was on the end of your bed and he announced some things to you, you would treasure them, wouldn't you? I would. Wow. <sighs> but you got angels and you got blue collar shepherds 
giving truth, but Mary took those truths and treasured them deeply. Joshua 1.8 says, The book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it, for then you will make your, make your way prosperous and you will have great success. Psalm 119.15, I will meditate on your precepts and fix my eyes on your ways. Psalm 1.2, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. So if you're not seeing enough change um, in your life, then I would encourage you to consider more contemplative sort of experiences where you sit and you read the scriptures or you read a devotional or you take a teaching and you say, what part of this, dear Father, is for me? What is the deeper truth for me? Where do I need to live for me? Because, because here, here's part of the story in Mary's humble story that Jesus came out of Mary, a human being. And here's the deep truth. When you put your faith in Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ takes residence within you. And the longer he resides within you, eventually he will come out. He will come out in your words. He will come out in your actions. He will come out. And if he isn't coming out, if, if your words and your actions and your decisions are not reflective of a Jesus who dwells within you, and next week we're going to look back at Ephesians about how much the scriptures indicate Christ is in us and what that means that Christ is in us. But Christ is in us. And because he is in us, he will reveal and come out of us in our conversations and our treatment. And so uh, an interesting experience that you might want to consider is what and how much is Jesus being expressed in and through my life? How are my words leaking out differently than they were two years ago? Because Jesus is renovating my heart. What is there in my decision making that's different than it was two years ago? Because he is taking up full residency in my life. He's He's taking every room of my heart over. Not, my, not just my religious room, not my church room, every room of my life. And so here's the truth this morning that I want you to walk away with. God values, adores, treasures humility. And he abhors pride and arrogance. Karen and I were in Florence. It was a great experience sitting there, and, and, and literally right next to us was a table of four kids from England. And if, and if, I, if I hadn't studied it long enough, I really wouldn't, I, I would have thought I was being set up, but I wasn't being set up. Four kids, blue blood kids, very wealthy kids, kids on their weekend vacation with their parents' money. And, and as I listened to their conversation, some six feet away, as I looked at what they ate and how they dressed and what they talked about and how they talked about their friends, the whole conversation seeped arrogance and pride. How they looked at the people who served them was arrogance and pride. How they talked about their families was arrogance and pride. And I was repulsed by, by who they were, and how much better they thought they were than anybody else at the restaurant because they were there for the weekend and they may have even come in on mom's or dad's Learjet. It was that seeping. And then I thought as Karen and I got on the bus to go back, um, I wonder how much of my life sounds to God arrogantly. Well, how, much of, how much seepage is there in my life? I have a friend, Jerry Petalon, who, who refers to me as the man with the hole in his shoe. Uh, because I told him when I was in high school, I went to school with a hole in my shoe. And I put cardboard in the bottom of my shoe so it would somehow protect me from the hole in my shoe. 
But by the time I got home every night, the cardboard that I'd put there from the cereal box had worn through. And not only had that worn through, but the hole in my sock had worn through. But I treasure that shoe. I'm the kid with the hole in his shoe. I have been my whole life. And I treasure it. I am not any better than anyone else in this room, trust me. I am the man with the hole in my shoe. And there's something beautiful when we begin to open our lives in humility and serve each other in kindness and not look at anyone on any stature other than they're a child of God. And we tell the truth of our story because we don't have to protect our ego, our pride, our status. We just reveal our story. And by revealing the truth of our story in humility, we begin to become precious people. You know what the powerful part of this story is? The shepherds, blue collar, midnight, night shift workers were the first evangelists of the gospel. God took them and sent them out. And so I say to you, please do not allow your status or your night shift or your home or your car stop you from praising God and revealing him to a world that needs to know them as if you're not, you're not a Billy Graham. You're not, you're, you, you don't have enough stature. They'll look at your hole in the bottom of your Shoe. And I say to you, I think God ends that passage with the shepherds leaving, praising God and telling people. Because when you encounter God deeply, I think the fruit of that is praise. And when you meet the one who saved you, whose death on the cross and your faith in him is your only means to inherit eternal life, when you experience the depth of that, that, that will become a part of your story at work, at home, in your neighborhood, in your home. God, here, here's the truth. God wants you to be the evangelist, not me. It's part of the Christmas story. These guys encountered an incredible story and could not not share it. And the more we understand how incredible the story is, the more difficult it is not to share it. And the more that we encounter the living Christ within us, the more we're driven to somehow look for an opportunity in every conversation that somehow we can tell the person we're with who will never come into this building that there's one who wants to come into them. It's a beautiful story that should not just be lived on Christmas or the day after Christmas. It is a story to be lived every day. If you choose to take communion, go to the back or front, grab the elements, hold on to them, and we'll partake together. And then you take the aluminum foil and slowly pull it back. Um, while you're doing that, let me read again what I think is about what communion is all about. Philippians chapter 2, verse 5. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself by taking on the form of a servant, being born in, in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Take eat in remembrance of the one who came to die for you.
And the cup, a reminder that obedience sometimes has a cost to it. But when we understand all that he did for us, in comparison, it is an insignificant cost. Take drink in remembrance of him. If you want to be baptized in the snow, we'll do it. We will do it. If you need somebody to pray for you, there'll be people in the corner. If you would like to accept Jesus Christ and bring him into your heart, we would do that. We would love to do that. Let me pray. Father, um, be with these dear people. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, may whatever truth, whatever words are from you, may they enter deeply into all of our hearts. Father, in a culture that screams pride and arrogance and up, may we lower ourselves. May we humble ourselves. May we serve each other. May we May we wash each other's feet. May we do what we need to do because it is who you are and, who, and the example that Jesus left for us. Dear Father, thank you for choosing us. Jesus, thank you for coming to save us. Holy Spirit, thank you for sealing us. And Father, may we live this week a bit more humble than we did last week. And we pray these things in your name. Amen. Amen. Have a great afternoon.